Welcome everyone and thank you for attending this Academic Integrity and Artificial Intelligence webinar. Before we begin this afternoon, the QCAA would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their elders and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country and we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. We thank them for sharing their cultures and spiritualities and recognise the important contribution of this knowledge to our understanding of this place we call home. Today's webinar is the first in a series of three webinars exploring the opportunities and considerations of responding to and using generative AI technology. By the end of this webinar, we aim to have developed your understanding of ethical scholarship and why recent developments in artificial intelligence present new opportunities and considerations for school. We are joined this afternoon by Dr. Christine Slade, Associate Professor at the University of Queensland's Institute for Teaching and Learning Innovation and expert in academic integrity. Christine will share some of the contemporary research associated with ethical scholarship that is important to understand as we respond to the use of artificial intelligence in our schools. With her colleagues, Christine has contributed to UQ's response to developing an academic integrity action plan and delivered the TESCA funded National Academic Integrity Workshops. TESCA is the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, which you will hear Christine refer to a few times today. We will also hear from Scott Adamson, Dean of Teaching and Learning, as well as Principal's Delegate, Chief and Lead Marker and Confirmer. Scott has a keen interest in digital pedagogies, change management and e-learning and is responsible for his school's assessment policy. Since November last year, we have heard a lot about the opportunities and risks associated with generative AI, in particular ChatGPT. ChatGPT was the fastest growing app in history, reaching over 100 million users by January of this year and is now over 1 billion users. In comparison, TikTok took nine months and Instagram two and a half years to reach 100 million users. ChatGPT and other emerging technologies have opened a myriad of possibilities that may revolutionise the way we work and study. We know that ChatGPT as a chatbot can have human-like conversations where it can provide feedback on a report, Bing Chat can summarise an online document for easier reading, and Bard can write an email in a style of choice. So while the emergence of generative AI presents new opportunities to support teaching and learning, it has also renewed our focus on academic integrity and assessment practices. For the QCAA, this is a key area of interest as we seek to ensure that all students, schools and parents maintain confidence that our young people receive fair recognition for the work they have done. To support schools across Queensland, we have new artificial intelligence guidance documents on our website and we've updated both the student and the teacher academic integrity courses. This webinar provides another opportunity to help us understand how to support our students as we respond to emerging AI in the context of academic integrity. After we have heard from both of our presenters, we will have time, we hope, to address a few questions um, at the end. Now it is my pleasure to hand over to Christine. Thanks, Joe. So it's really good to have everyone here. So. I actually am the lead of assessment and academic integrity in the institute I've been in, and this year has certainly been a roller coaster ride of understanding. So I have been conscious that while I'm actually um, an academic and I can access a whole lot of literature, etc., that perhaps you can't in your schools, I was trying to um, provide you with some access. So. The slide is, is talking about the resources that are available from the presentation. So I've been able to gather together those that are open source and put them in a Google Drive folder, which is accessed from um, that either the QR code, so you can do that now if you want to, or by the um, URL, the short URL. Okay, next slide, please. So the first thing I wanted to say, I guess, is what is academic integrity? I mean, it's a term that we use quite freely and it can be confusing sometimes um, with either the values, so the values of honesty, trust, fairness, respect, um, responsibility, encouraging learning. So that aspirational side 
and also the things that we're doing, which we would call assessment security, that is toughening or putting requirements around our assessment so that we can limit student cheating uh, or know that cheating is um, has occurred. And for a long time there, it was quite confusing just to use that one term, academic integrity. And we can be thankful to Professor Phil Dawson from Cradle at Deakin, who introduced the idea of separating it so that we have different terms um, for different types of functions that we're doing. So that can help you with your articulation uh, in discussions around this topic. And I guess the second thing I wanted to say about this is that academic integrity is only situated when students are studying. So for your students, it's quite a long time, perhaps. For ours, it might only be three, four years. But that is not excluded from their own personal or professional integrity. So I see them now, probably even more so with Gen AI coming on the scene, that they should be uh, integrated, that they should be seen as one whole, um, I guess, literacy or ethical position that we need to have. Thank you. Next slide. So what are the challenges? Well, you can see from the slide we have a few. So in higher education, we probably have maybe six or seven that we have listed in our policies. But I did have a look at the QCAA handbook, which I think actually nicely articulates all the different types of behaviours that we can see as academic misconduct. So if you haven't looked at something like that for a while, have a little read because you have things in there like specifically talking about cheating in supervised conditions. So obviously you think immediately of exams. Collusion, well, that's been around for a long time. Um, you know, students doing something together and tipping over the collaboration mark and actually falling into submitting the same types of work. Contract cheating, we talk about that a lot in higher education, and I'll explain why soon, but you also have that in the handbook as well. So contract cheating is actually paying someone or getting somebody or a third party, so you could think of Gen AI if you put something into chat and then take that whole answer and make it the answer to your assignment, and you submit that, then you're submitting it as somebody else has done the work for you. That's what we call contract cheating. And it can be family members, it can be you know fellow students, but the one we are particularly concerned about in our field is the online cheating sites. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that in a little while. Obviously, copying work is um, something that's easy to do or tem the temptation is easy. Data fabrication, giving or receiving unauthorised information, so trying to get the quick look before the exams open. Identity personation is quite serious, obviously, and then we have the perennial plagiarism. Thank you. So I won't labour this one, but these come from the TEXA. So Joe's mentioned who TEXA is. It's the Higher Education Regulatory Body. We did national workshops for them across the country um, in 2019-20, and there was some very good information about academic integrity in those slides, and this is one of them. Uh, I have given you a link to that in the resource folder. But just to say, you can see we've had some sensations in the sector. The particular, probably the most um, pronounced one was the My Master scandal, where the public press uh, announced to everyone one morning that they had information about over 1,000 higher education students having used that contract cheating or commercial cheating site uh, and paid people to ghostwrite their assignments. And that just led to a whole lot of other uh, things happening and awareness about the challenges. TEXA became, um, felt the need then to actually make everyone be regulated around what we report because, you know, we needed to understand what students were getting information about, how we're recording things, etc. cetera. And, and so it went on. And, you know, we've had one case of exam impersonation from SBS, so you can have a look at these slides later. There will be a copy. So all to say Gen AI is very sensational, um, but we have had a few others previously that probably actually are more on the negative side, whereas Gen AI has a very positive side as well. Thank you.
Um, and just to add to that, because you notice that slide only went to 2018, of course, 2022 was the big year of DAL-E2, uh, better imaging, uh, GitHub Copilot, you know, for the coders. And of course, we know all about, uh, or we are learning all about chat GPT. And it was because of that public accessibility that it became such an alarming um, sensation. Thank you. What are the risks? There's quite a few risks, of course. Universities, schools should be worried about their reputation. You know, if they have a big scandal, it doesn't look good for new students or for the existing students. Um, we have underqualified graduates in society. So for us, that's a serious thing. Um, and you hear the stories of the engineer who can't build the bridge or the doctor who's not trained um, to be able to deal with patients. So that's a big concern. Inside our institutions, we have threats to the culture of honesty. So we don't want to always harp on about dishonesty because we have many, many uh, honest students and we want to respect them for that culture that they have. It does create a, um, an impact on the morale of academics. So they do find it difficult that their students are cheating and not learning as such. And um, it also takes quite a bit of work for them if they have to investigate any of it. And of course, there's equity issues as well. So the question really comes down to, is the student that's done the work the one who should be getting credit for it? So are they the same person? Thank you. And I was asked to talk a little bit about who cheats. And these lists that you can see are really from the research. It's not me just making up a list because I know some people don't actually like the first one they see there, which is males or young students. Um, but this is what researchers have been investigating. And Tracy Bretag, who was a very famous um, academic integrity researcher in Australia, uh, she did a very large study, and these are some of the things that came out of that, and you'll see her name there uh, in several of them. So for various reasons, which I'll talk about perhaps later, male students tend to cheat more, and younger students. Um, we know, for example, if you look down to engineering students, that's often the cohort. They do a lot of group work, so they fall into collusion. Uh, they talk a lot you know, with peers, and they tend to can tend to cheat. Business students also are another category, um, and international students. And note there, it's not we're targeting international students, but we're conscious that the language barriers are often the problem that they have uh, rather than their culture from which they come from. So thank you. So there's lots of reasons as to why students cheat or plagiarise. Um, and the first slide there is about psychological state. So what is it about that person that might give them the inclination to cheat? And there's, a, again, a few things there. Low conscientiousness, and so we would say maybe lazy. Anxiety, I think, is a big one these days. Um, low self-control, so they can't plan what they're going to do. They um, don't, you know, prioritise. It's not only the lazy or maybe the students that can't organise themselves. There's also um, students who are highly competitive that um, want to get better marks as well. Impulsivity, low confidence or poor resilience. So there's quite a bit of research there on that too. But the, thanks, um, Anthony. But the next slide is probably the more encouraging. And this would be the majority of students. So why do students decide not to cheat? Um, next slide. And this comes from uh, an Australian study. It is in your open source resource list that I have put in the folder. And these are the students, and I'd say the majority of students, they know why they're studying. So for us, I guess they know why they're at university. Perhaps in schools it might be a little bit more difficult, but they do know what they want to achieve. They also have a morality or a, a compass inside of them that knows what is a good thing to do and what isn't, and the norms, they appreciate the norms of the society in which that happens. They have respect for their teachers, so they're, um, you know, they're 
getting, I suppose, having a relationship in some ways with that teacher and so therefore then are not afraid to ask for support. And the other interesting one was that they could get extensions if they needed them, so extensions on submitting their assessment. They did fear detection and consequences, so they could see the consequences of the actions and weren't stuck in the moment, and they didn't really trust anybody else to do their assessment tasks for them. So therefore, because of all of these things, they didn't see opportunity to cheat. Thank you. Now, I just wanted to point out in this couple of slides, this is not every student, but it is an interesting thing that we have published about um, in the fact of situational ethics. So yes, we must have hardened cheaters have probably come through your institutions as well as other places to us or they, you know, they develop these habits and they will cheat and see the opportunity to cheat everywhere they can. But we are more concerned, I guess, in some ways around a bigger body of students that might be um, persuaded to cheat. So in the example that's on this slide, Basically, it's when no absolute conviction between right and wrong is evident and depending on the pressure that's placed on that student or the type of cheating that's presented to them, they may choose to um, cheat. And there's an example there from a paper that talks about first-year engineering students and they could see uh, the 52 of them were asked, "What do you, do you consider these behaviours cheating? Copying homework for another student, definitely. 96% of them said, yes, that's definitely cheating. But when they were asked, what about accessing an online solution manual to do homework problems, only 2% said that was cheating. But you could see how easy that would be to just copy the answers. Next slide, please. So what is artificial intelligence? So the other concept I was going to talk about is vulnerability of students to cheating messages, and we just need to be mindful that the, the um, process of, you know, investigation and perhaps consequences that are imposed on students should be educative for them. So let's just turn to artificial intelligence. The little square there or rectangle natural language process is really the only part of artificial intelligence that we're looking at right now. Uh, so the natural language processing models, and of course the most common one of those is ChatGPT. So that is sort of set off all of this sensationalism. Thank you. Next slide. And this is my own observations, because I've been doing this work now in the Gen AI space since the beginning of the year. And honestly, for I think for all of us, everybody involved, you know, the teachers at your schools, the principals, the policy makers, all of us in higher ed, it's like being trapped in a complicated maze sometimes and you just wish there was one simple way out. Or driving in the rain, you just can't quite see what you'd really like to be able to see, a clear picture of how we're getting through. Or we're climbing this mountain and it just keeps going and going and going. Um, but what I want to stress there is, um, is that we are all in the same space and so therefore we are facing the understanding, they're trying to grapple with that understanding of the concepts and the knowledge around Gen A altogether. And what I would call that space from my background um, is liminality, so the uncertainty of being stuck in that space. And I want to give you confidence today that you, we, responses will be clear over time especially if we all work together and share our knowledge. Next slide, please. And the other way I think that would be helpful for you is to find ways to maintain currency. So the pace of all this is moving very fast, but like you're at the webinar now, so hopefully we can give you something that will help you understand how to address this in your own context. But there's other ways, meeting with colleagues, reading, um, whatever works for you that doesn't take too much of your time to be able to make, maintain your currency of what's actually happening around this space. And then just I think the last slide is um, a reminder that I have put in resources for you in um, the folder. And again, if you want to do it now, you can click on that with the QR code or with the um, URL. Thank you. 
Thank you, Christine, for sharing your research. And I guess for us in particular, highlighting that the importance of viewing academic integrity holistically. I love the way you talked about integrity being academic, professional and personal. And I think that sets a lovely context for all of us in our um, educational settings too. And even before we hand over to Scott, um, I'm even to mention, I know we all appreciate the opportunities that I think you spoke about around generative um, AI, but it's also important to understand um, what motivates our students sometimes during that learning journey and um, therefore knowing how that we might respond as um, teachers as well to guide them. So now we welcome Scott Adamson, who is going to share with us the work he has led in his school to prepare some guidelines that will support um, students and teachers uh, to safely and ethically use AI for its educative purpose. So thank you, Scott, and I will hand over to you now. Many thanks, Joe, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I do appreciate the time um, that you're devoting to this. And look, I just want to say at the outset that I'm very glad to share our um, school's response thus far as we've been working through uh, and engaging with uh, generative AI. Um, it's not so much as an exemplar, but rather it's a collection of points for consideration for you as you grapple with this significant disruptor in education. And it's quite clear that it's not going anywhere anytime soon. So I'm going to talk through a little, a little bit about our responses, our approaches, the writing of our guidelines and maybe some of the supporting timelines. So I'm hoping that you can take some value from that. There is no denying that generative AI has, um, it's here to stay and it's permeating everything that we do from how we live and work and learn and interact with each other. But our challenge really is about how we learn about it, how we embrace the affordances and become knowledgeable about the limitations that go along with it to then be um, effective and ethical users of this. So we're really thinking about the purpose that we that there is behind the actual uses of this technology. Um, one might actually say that our, us as teachers have a moral imperative of how to educate our students to work with this, given that the society that they are walking into when they leave our school gates at the end of year 12 is really one where um, they'll be living inside of um, the world of generative AI. Um, I just want to talk about on their next slide, thanks Anthony, um, the nature of how students might receive it if uh, teachers are thinking about, um, you know, some of our first reactions may have been that uh, we're just assuming students are going to use this to cheat and that's certainly something which they would take issue with and in particular um, they want us to know that um, their motivation is about learning for the vast majority of them. So uh, I'm just warning people not to get caught up in the hype about um, understanding what our students' actual motivations are because they are here to be able to learn. Uh, one of the questions that we really got when we were thinking about our school culture is about the classroom community, the thoughtful assessment design, and I know the QCRAA has a range of resources for us to consider about that. But we were thinking a lot about how we um, collaborate, uh, collaborate inside of our classroom and in our community, how we've developed our academic culture, how we've had both vertical as well as horizontal supports, supports between students as well as with our teachers. Um, we've been looking at how we've planned to provide the time inside of class for students to be grappling and completing assignments and having that one-to-one -one and face-to-face -face feedback with our teachers, as well as just growing in their confidence and competence so they don't, are not feeling some of those pressures. So as Christine spoke of before, um, for students to make poor choices about cheating, it's really about motivation, which may include fear and a lack of time and a disinterest, but also means and opportunity. And ChatGPT and other generative AIs provide a lot of those means and opportunity, but the motive is the thing that the students don't want us to be questioning, when in fact they do want to learn. They're human beings, and one of those insatiable things about human beings is we all want to learn. So um, we also looked and spoke of a bit of uh, using thoughtful dialogue uh, with our students class and thoughtful language so praising results is one thing praising effort is um, another and then better still probably praising resilience when the students have found something difficult and they've picked themselves back up or they've had to work through something so that disposition is something we've been focusing on 
We've also recognised those points of student overload. And this is something else that Christine spoke to before is just, you know, from providing the time inside of class time for this work to occur, it also helps us know our students, um, but also that opportunity for extensions when students have got themselves in a bit of a pickle and they have to address that in some way, how we uh, sort of respond to that compassionately and give them an opportunity to further engage rather than go down making a poor choice. Thanks, Anthony. Um, now, just for a little bit of context, I wanted to look into some of the learning supports and the attributes of a range of things that students have been using for a long time. So collusion is nothing new, neither is plagiarism. Um, I remember when the internet was first a thing, when I was at high school myself at the time, and that was thought to be the end of everything in terms of um, democratisation of knowledge and people not having to learn to remember anything anymore. Um, there were similar concerns when Wikipedia came out. Um, there were similar concerns with Encyclopedia Britannica, I'm sure. So um, educational institutions and communities have been grappling with these things over a long period of time. And there is a time and place for all these different learning um, supports and attributes, and whether it's Google Bard or Bing or ChatGPT, generative AI has a role in there, but it also has limitations that go with it. So. Uh, I think it's just important to recognise with their staff just it's one thing in a whole um, plethora of different learning supports which are there and can be used um, for good rather than evil. We'll pop over to the next slide. Thanks, Anthony. Now, this is a curve that you perhaps have seen before, maybe you're familiar with it. It's the Dunning-Kruger curve and it's a little bit like that um, being in that uh, pit of... Um, proximal development and learning, being in the learning pit. Um, perhaps you can identify where you are on this, or maybe if you haven't seen this before, you might immediately recognise that when you've seen something new uh, and you've had to work through something, you've seen a bit about its affordances, you've had to just learn a bit more, and as you learn more about it, you realise just how little you do know about it and how it operates and how it works and the implications of it, and you go down this deep path of trying to determine what are, you know, how does this sit in my, in my work, in my principles, in how I actually work with my students? And considering those different elements helps us derive, it's kind of like that, um, I see it akin to working from that being unconsciously incompetent and developing enough understanding to then become consciously competent um, in the use of it, the application of it inside of classrooms and with students. So. Perhaps you can identify on there, maybe you're coming out the other side of it now and you're ready to just delve into it and actually have those conversations with students. But just, I guess the point is, there's a reality check for us all in that all of our teachers need to move through that process. And they may not realise this at first. And we might find that reactive um, fright or flight sort of um, reaction from some of our teachers when they first encounter it. Thank you, Anthony. Now, some of the reflections on initial implementation of ChatGPT might be things like this, not trusting it immediately, realising that um, actually so much of it is about effective prompts. And if you are able to write effective prompts, you're able to get more out of the tool itself. And quality prompt writing is one of the first areas that um, teachers and students may focus on developing. And then that third point is about understanding what the value is of it and actually knowing that this is something that we all need to be um, approaching and, and to be working with. All right, thanks, Anthony. So ultimately, we arrived at a position after many months of talking through, comparing, we made a chat line within our staff. We had teachers and leaders all interacting, sharing um, understandings, um, readings, and their uh, explicit sort of scenarios that they tried to put through it to then be able to develop what our approach was. And really it became this one of, we want to recognise that it has a use, we need to be critical in its use. It's part of digital literacy. Academic integrity is, is heavily involved in it as well. It's a conversation with that together. Um, so if we want to look at using this, we need to look at how we use it ethically, responsibly and effectively inside of our classrooms. Now, I just have a couple of slides here with some approaches for teachers and approaches for students. 
there's probably nothing new here that you haven't seen before. And as you'll see, I've tried to identify our different um, authors that some of this information has been borrowed from. Uh, and this is just a subset of them as well. But you may have seen some of these before. Um, certainly the recent ACARA submission into the inquiry on the use of generative artificial intelligence in the Australian education system. This identifies that teachers may mitigate risk by not only modelling the appropriate use of AI, but also amplifying the messages of engaging with AI for beneficial purpose and the critical evaluation of risks when choosing to do so. So we're not just using it for using sake, we're actually using it as a tool for learning further and critical evaluation is one of those very aspects of what makes humans human inside of there. Um, there's a little saying just because you can doesn't mean you should and I think that's something for us to keep in mind when we are working with um, the potential of generative AI that we would like to select the right tool for the purpose um, and we've always done that as teachers it's part of what we actually do. If we have a look at some of the approaches for students, thanks Anthony, you'll see here that you know typically you'd probably work with your teachers in the first instance and then start um, dipping your toes into the water with working with students in that way. So here's a range of different um, opportunities to be able to use it. There are immense numbers of different ways that people go about it and having those open conversations with our teachers, it's amazing the creativity that they come up with in different applications you hadn't thought of. And often it's the, con the contrasting, the contrary, the flawed responses, which are the great learning tools. So it's not just about perfection, it's about um, finding the areas that you can actually have good learning and teachable moments. Now, the final part of my presentation, I'd like to talk just more about our approach and our guidelines that we've written. Um, one thing that I've been reflecting on in the last um, couple of days in preparation for this is just been not letting um, good be the uh, enemy of great in that, you know, we could always write better and better guidelines and engage with it better when we have a bit more information. But at some point in time, we've all got to just jump in with both feet. So um, I'd be just recommending that actually having the conversations, starting the ball rolling is well worth doing and bring people on the journey with you. Um, no one professes to have all of the answers about where this is going. I mean, actually prior to November of last year, a lot of us didn't see this quite just around the corner like it has been. Um, so our approach, as you can see there, has been about trying to empower students to effectively use AI, and we've been trying to bring our teachers and now our students on that journey. If we have a look at some of the actual elements of the guidelines, like I'm not going to share a seven-page set of guidelines with you now, but what's most important is some of the different elements that go into it, including that rationale and the moral imperative for use. So some of those quotes I've used before have been there to help guide where we're going. And then from there, some sample approaches for teachers and students, greater amounts of context about how generative AI might sit in amongst all the other tools that students and learners can use. Um, but I guess every one of the elements that you see inside of here has purpose inside of the guidelines. Um, we've also, at that same time, one of the supporting appendices you'll see there is the breaches of academic integrity guidelines. So we updated those at the same time, thinking in particular about that point of collusion, thinking about our points of um, plagiarism, and in particular, um, the uh, element of significant contributions of help from other sources. And that's why we, we actually included using an agent such as generative AI inside of there. So we've been using it and having students quote that or recognise it if they are going to go to that as a source of any sort. It's really just taken as a personal contribution. And yeah, in uh, terms of supporting timelines, just to be able to give you a, an idea of the sort of time involved in working this through with our um, staff. It's really one where we've been working at it for eight, nine months now. And over that period of time, we've taken the time to bring people with us. So we've really looked at trying to be collaborative, to share a range of opportunities for people to engage, to familiarise. We've had a few departmental meetings. We've had um, several 
full staff meetings engaging with it. We've had champions and we've had some people who are working to help share um, best practice. So it is moving to that sort of phase of wider implementation now after engaging with it for about eight months. Do we have everybody on the journey? Probably not. Do we have most people on the journey? I would say yes. And from the get go, uh, we just took the time to determine what our rationale was about how we would approach it as a as a school. So those are some of the key points about our guidelines and considerations that have um, led to where we are and how we are uh, supporting this at the moment. I've got two more slides. One here is just about, this is our conclusion from our guidelines. And you'll see here that our key points include that, you know, AI applications can enrich student learning. Our schools need to adopt an open-minded and um, adaptable stance towards AI. The development of digital literacy is one which is encompassed with academic integrity and it's a responsibility of all of our teachers and that these guidelines are provided for teachers and students to be able to use AI responsibly. So those are some of the key elements there. And look, for my final slide, I just want to um, uh, talk a little bit about the knowing your why. So standing back, um, like any technology, digital or not, we need um, the pedagogy there to be taking the lead. We don't want the cart before the horse. So we do want to think about what the purpose is uh, of our learning, um, becoming competent users and providing opportunities for our students to actively engage with it, be critical with it and to grow to be competent with it as well. So, look, that's the sort of conclusion of the points that I'd um, like to talk to and to be able to share. I'm very happy to respond to things inside of the Q&A and I can see uh, Brendan's question there. Um, in terms of uh, contextual information about our school, I'm an in, uh, independent school, um, so we don't have some of the other supports of other areas, but we've been working with writing our own guidelines and leaning heavily on the QCAA, who's now been providing a range of different guidelines like that. I am in a metropolitan school, but I think the way that I want to talk to this is kind of school agnostic. These are just um, some reflections from me as a leader working with a range of teachers, um, some of whom are famously on board with this and all over it, other ones that are coming on the journey with everybody else and have all worked through that pit of learning on the way. Okay, so um, those are my key points and I do thank you for your time and uh, I'll pass back to uh, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. That was very insightful and we appreciate and I think the chat window has indicated that too. We are very appreciative um, of the fact that you've been so willing to share that information with everyone. Um, I in particular loved hearing about how you have considered staff and students. I guess um, that is the question too. We are all going to be using generative AI into the future by staff and students. So developing guidelines like that to assist your community and develop that culture of academic integrity is really important. And also really appreciating your focus on empowering students in that space. So thank you very much. We now have a small window of time that we've allowed for just to ask some questions of Christine and Scott. So um, there's a couple of questions that have come through even prior to the meeting. Um, and I'm more than happy for people to actually add questions in the chat window and we can ask them as well. Um, I've taken a couple of the questions that have been asked even in the lead up to this meeting just to um, start off. And Christine, I guess the first one actually um, uh, is a question for you. Um, and Christine, I'm happy for you. Oh, yes, your video is on. Um, we've been talking about academic integrity for a while, and I think you've also highlighted that the work around the universities have been talking about it for some time. But I guess the question is, how has generative AI um, required us as educators to think differently about, I guess, the authentication strategies that we use with students? Very good question. Thanks, Jo. <laughs> I see a lot of the um, authentication strategies as similar to contract cheating at the moment. Like if you use Turnitin or a data matching service, um, you can usually see plagiarism quite clearly. So it's very easy to see what the student's done. But if you take something that's personalised, which Gen AI is and contract cheating ghostwriting is, that they've bought it, 
then that's much more difficult. Um, and so we use, and I must say on the Texas site, they also have helps for this, but they have, um, we discovered over time with contract cheating, there was properties about the document, um, there was things about the actual showing of the document itself that indicated there was something wrong. Uh, and that took collaborative effort from, you know, researchers, et cetera, understanding it. And I can see Gen AI is a bit like that. So if you take, for example, people discovered early, though I'm sure it will be corrected later, that referencing was a problem for um, chat and therefore it was making them up, things like that. Other examples I've heard from people is like it's too generic, so it actually doesn't understand the discipline area that you're asking the students to write to. Um, in time, I think there'll be other properties. Um, you know, there could be it just doesn't make sense, some of the things. It's, you know, and it depends, as Scott said, on how good the student is at prompting. So if you, given all those things, I think, you know, it's this mainstream authentication that you can do, and usually it's around adding something or taking something away. So if you think about, I want to know this student has actually done this, you can allow some time in class to start that piece of work, or you do more drafting than we do, you know, hand in a draft. So you're getting an idea, one, the student started on time without panicking and, you know, they haven't left it to the end. You're also seeing about their style. You actually have much more advantage than we do in knowing your students because we have classes up to a thousand students. So, you know, things like that, <clears throat> checking in on them about the rationale of what they've written. There's a whole lot of stuff out there. So if you think it's similar to that, I think that will help people get the clues um, about the types of things that give you an indication that it's not um, authentic to that student. I know that doesn't answer all your questions. No, no, thank you. <laughs> but it is true. We've had we have authentication strategies, um, I guess, in the handbook, and it's something that um, uh, we talk about a lot with schools, and schools talk a lot with as well. So, no, that was that was a very good answer. Um, one of the, um, I guess, resources that we do provide schools, and I might pass this question on to uh, Scott, one of the resources is the Academic Integrity course, and it's obviously become a big discussion piece within schools about how we use this as a resource to build that understanding of academic integrity. Scott, am I able to pass this question over to you in terms of how you use that course within your um, setting? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, in terms of using uh, the academic integrity course, which is inside of uh, the student portal, we've had the students sign up for that. We actually register our students in year 10, so we know that they're actually registered inside of the portal. Then in year 11, at the very start of the year, we we open it up for them. I actually do a little assembly presentation with the year 11s about the importance of academic integrity. Um, I'm currently working on how that will look now with um, you know, OpenAI or Google Bard being etc. or being there together. So I'm going to cover both of those together and then I put it open for a period of about three weeks where I ask students to take the time to work through those courses over that time and I just do a weekly monitor until I've I'm satisfied that I've got every one of those students. I can't profess and say I've got every single one of them and there are some of them that need more chasing than others and that's that's natural part of when you work with a cohort of students. So, um, But it's something we take very seriously and we impress on them, take the time to have that assembly at the start of year 11 and then we know that we've got that covered and we can refer to it again if there's any issues that creep up or anyone needs particular reminders. We've got that as, a, as another point to go back to. Thanks, Scott. We really appreciate that too. Um, it's it's certainly a conversation in that earlier stages of Unit 1, 2, 3 and 4, particularly seniors, but um, I guess even from the QCAA perspective, looking we're looking at resources because we know that that education piece about academic integrity still needs to come far earlier than, than that Year 11 and 12. Um, I guess this might be a Scott question as well too. Um, we obviously have um, even parents make contact with us, but some teachers have also talked about parents making contact with schools and wanting to be part of that education process. 
So I just wonder from either Christine or Scott, um, some ideas about how we might engage parents in this space and in this conversation and what they need to know. That's great. Well, I'm, I'm happy to talk to that person and pass over to Christine if she has any further comment as well. Um, I would just say our parents are going to be coming through the same pathway as we as teachers have in that at first they might be, you know, if we're hearing the narrative of what you read in the newspaper, then it's uh, all doom and gloom, very much so. So we, what we really recognise is that they also are coming on that journey as well. So a bit of a, a drip feed and newsletter articles, some really good uh, pointed examples about how these actually um, can be applied um, in positive ways, as well as some of the fallibility. So I think some of those great examples of how that it could be used with teachers and used with students can help mm -hmm. Um, allay parents' fears about that as well. We haven't actually gone to the point of having a parent information evening about it at the moment, but we have had that drip feed of information going to our, our parents in that way. So we're part way down that journey and uh, we're wanting our students to be very much the ambassadors of how that looks and to be able to have those sensible conversations at home too about it. Well, and that's about empowering the students, isn't it? Um, and just before you leave us, um, Scott and Christine, I wonder if you can just share with everyone um, perhaps a couple of takeaways from this. Scott, your work around the guidelines and Christine, your work around the research around academic integrity. A couple of takeaways for the group to go forward from this point um, and use this information. Scott, I might hand over to you first. Okay, thank you, Jo. Um, I would say... Um, just on reflection, some of the things that I've taken away with this is that, you know, that statement I said before about don't let good be the, uh, uh, don't let great be the enemy of good. Um, you have to make a decision, jump in, start engaging with it and encourage others to as well. No one's going to have the perfect solution, the perfect response, and it is a changing landscape. Even if we look at what's happened since November and the different iterations of the of the 3.5, the TDP4, um, and where it's going, it's about to explode into essentially everything. My understanding is it's inside of Snapchat now as well, and most students don't know how to actually turn that off, and they're actually inviting um, generative AI into conversations. So um, it's, it's out there, and we've got to learn to deal with it. Actually, we have that moral imperative to deal with it. So... Um, it doesn't mean it's the end of learning. So my big takeaway really is, it's like any other tool. We use it for its purpose, identify, know enough about it to know what the purpose, where it can be applied, where it can't be applied, knowing its failings as well as its affordances, uh, where you're best equipped to be able to do that. So let's encourage the conversations. Thank you. Mm, that's good. I agree. I don't think we should be fearful. I think we need to be confident quietly confident. Uh, it's a bit like COVID with Zoom and how many of us have the story of what we did wrong and everyone was very accepting, you know, became much more accepting that we were all were learning together. I think have the coffee with the person who might know a bit more or who can show you how to start. And, you know, it's always an interesting exercise to try first, uh, who am I? Ask chat, who are you? And see what it comes up with. Often it's not correct. And the other one is have a try of one of your assessment tasks and put it in and see if it can answer it. Um, they're quite interesting tasks to do, but it's all collaborative. We're all learning together. So, you know, get, get with somebody else or get your group in your discipline area of the school and start working together. Don't be intimidated to have a go. Thanks, Christine and Scott. They are great words of advice. And I guess it's a perfect segue as well to just remind people that um, we are, if you might remember right back to the very first slide, we're going to, this is a, um, a webinar in a three-part series. So the first one, we're, next one we're going to talk about assessment design and what we need to consider in that space around generative AI. So I hope people can join us in that space as well. I would like to thank Scott and Christine for their um, generous time this afternoon and for sharing their wise words and practice with us this afternoon. I hope people have been able to take some of those key takeaways um, from, the, um, from the webinar today. 
I'd probably just take two really important things away too that I've jotted down as you've been speaking. And the first one is knowing our students. Scott and Christine both spoke about knowing our students, particularly as generative AI um, will emerge and I guess the rapid pace of how it is changing. Um, the most important thing is to empower the students to know those, know those students that are in our classroom. Um, I guess the other one is, is around the academic integrity. And while that is probably um, a word that as students come through the senior years, it might be unfamiliar in some contexts, but just to be able to safely and ethically use some of these tools that really provide an opportunity, um, as well as being really aware of the risk in that space is what we really want to encourage, I guess, coming out of this webinar and moving forward. Thank you for joining us, everyone, and we look forward to um, seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you very much.